For over two years now, I've been working on my indie project, Isocore, and after all this time, I finally decided to tackle the biggest challenge I've ever faced in game dev. For those of you who are new here, first of all, hi, and thanks for stopping by. Isocore is a 2D isometric open-world sandbox game focused on exploration, farming, crafting, and building. And if you've seen any of my earlier videos, you've probably noticed that the world has always been completely flat. Well, not anymore. Ever since I started this project, there's been one request that I've gotten over and over again. So it seems like people really want some elevation in the game. For most of you, it also might seem like a logical step in the development of this project. But it's not like I didn't have that idea already. The truth is, until now, I've actually tried avoiding it for a long time. But why did it take me so long to start putting some elevation into the game, you might ask yourself. And there are multiple reasons which you're going to see later on in this video. But the request for this feature has been so incredibly large and consistent that I finally decided to give it a try. When you just look at the game without knowing what's happening under the hood, it might seem pretty straightforward to add some elevation. Just add some more blocks in a few places and you're done, right? Well, not quite. Isocore isn't a 3D game, it's a 2D pixel art game, which means that all sprites are completely two-dimensional and the entire game takes place on a flat 2D canvas. Every sprite has a 2D position on that canvas and a value called a sorting order. That sorting order acts as the third dimension in a 2D game, but it's not a real dimension. It simply tells the program in what order to draw the sprites so that the correct ones appear on top and the other ones below. So, that value isn't useful for any actual 3D logic. However, to have a dynamic 3D world, you need to know exactly where each object is on all three axes so you can calculate physics, collisions and other interactions correctly. That means that every object now needs two positions. An internal 3D position inside the world and the 2D canvas position you end up seeing on the screen. So, to implement elevation into a 2D game, I had to completely separate the game's internal functionality and calculations from its visual front end. Up until now, I could just use the 2D canvas position for everything. Movement, collision, rendering, all of it. But with how large this project has grown over time, doing the separation was a massive task. Still, there was no way around it, so I sat down and got to work. I also used the opportunity, since I had to touch most of the game's core systems anyway, to refactor some old code that was, let's just say, pretty bad and definitely overdue for a rewrite. After a good amount of time, I finally managed to separate all the internal mechanics from the front end. Now, every object is positioned internally using a 3D vector inside the terrain. When drawn on screen, that position gets passed through a few functions that calculate the correct canvas position and sorting order. With my game now using actual 3D positions to calculate everything, I could finally start working on the actual elevation feature. As I mentioned in the last video, I've been putting a lot more time and effort into this project the last couple of months. But while going to university, I end up working a lot from campus, libraries and cafes. So there is no real way around public Wi-Fi for me a lot of times. Which can become a real security issue, since the last thing you want is someone snooping on your connection or stealing your data by inserting themselves between your device and the router. But thankfully, I didn't have to worry about that for the last couple of months, thanks to this video's partner, NordVPN. NordVPN is a VPN provider that encrypts your internet traffic so that your data stays safe no matter where you're connected. At the same time, NordVPN is also able to recognize malicious links and warns you about dangerous websites, helping to keep you safe from phishing attacks. Also, nowadays, there's almost nothing you can do online without having to create an account first even for the most rudimentary things. And thinking of a new and complex password each time this happens is super tedious. And let's be honest, I'm pretty sure that most people don't do that. But using the same password over and over again is a huge security risk. All it takes is some company you gave your data to years ago and don't even remember to have a data leak and your email, phone number and connected password will be swimming around the internet for others to try them on your other accounts. But with NordVPN's password manager NordPass, which comes included in the Plus plan, this is no longer an issue. It keeps your password safe and makes it super easy to have highly complex and secure passwords for each and every account. Plus, it makes the login process much faster since you no longer need to remember them all or look them up. If you too want to keep yourself safer when browsing the web, downloading files and using public internet, you can use the link in my description or just go to nordvpn.com slash johnbricks to get your plan of NordVPN completely risk-free thanks to Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. And if you get a two-year plan through my link, Nord even throws an extra four months on top. Okay, so for now our terrain looks like this. Broken down to one dimension, the terrain is represented by this simple linear function. If we replace our flat line with a function that returns a random value for each position on the x-axis, we would get something like this. And while this already has some elevation, I think everybody can tell this is some horrible terrain for most games. The change in height are just way too drastic and unpredictable. So we need a way to change the terrain height gradually. A sine curve, for example, would do exactly that. Problem is that it just repeats itself every time. So we are missing the organic randomness. 
This is where parallel noise comes into play. Parallel noise is a mathematical function that returns a pseudo random value between a set minimum and a set maximum, which in my case is 0 and 1. With the catch that instead of jumping harshly like the function before, it smoothly transitions between them like the sine curve. Applying this to our terrain already makes it look much better, but this is still far away from ideal and feels very artificial still. To solve that, we apply a little trick called octaves. I have a video on my channel where I explain perlin noise, octaves and other things in depth and how I use them to generate biomes, vegetation, etc. So if you want to know more about that, check it out. But for the sake of simplicity and time, I'm going to skip that with the octaves applied to the function, you can see that the overall function is still contained between 0 and 1, but has much more detail and looks more organic. This already makes the terrain 10 times more natural looking. However, this still becomes very repetitive and does not feel very spectacular. For now, we've just been applying the value of our noise function to the base height level, which was 0 or C level. To create some interesting steep terrain changes, we can change this default terrain height that we apply the noise function to. For that, I create a second noise function and a height profile like this one, which tells the program what the terrain's default height is based on the second noise function. So for example, if a noise value of the second noise function is between 0 and 0 0.25, the default terrain height is minus 10. And if it is between 0 0.25 and 0 0.85, it is 5. However, when the second noise function is between 0 0.58 and 0 0.6, the height increases again to 25. If we use this on our terrain alone, you can see where the default elevation changes, which results in some very nice looking cliffs. Of course, this height profile can be adjusted as liked to generate all sorts of terrain and mountains. Now, if we apply our first noise function that we used for smaller height variations onto the default terrain height given by the height profile, we get a beautiful and natural looking terrain with small details, large cliffs and mountains. On top of that, we can now say that each air block that is below the level of zero becomes water, which gives us some nice and natural looking lakes and oceans. So now that we know how to generate the terrain, it's time to implement it into the game. Well, this is actually where things get tricky. The first thing you might already have noticed is that it's very hard to tell where a certain layer ends and where a new one begins. This is due to the fact that the game, being a 2D game, uses an orthographic camera. Normal cameras, like in 3D games or in real life, have a field of view that is a cone, meaning that it expands the further it gets. This has the effect that objects that are further away appear smaller. An orthographic camera, however, has a straight view field that does not change based on distance. This means that a sprite that is further away appears the same size as any other sprites that are closer. That makes it super hard to tell what is far away and what is close without some additional details and tricks. To combat that problem a bit, I first added some outlines to the edges when the terrain drops in elevation. This works to a degree, but still not well. You can see that there's an edge, but it's not possible to tell how far down it goes. And this is a problem I'm still trying to solve. If you have any ideas on how to solve this, feel free to leave them in the comments. By the way, if you like the project and want to support it, please consider wishlisting Isocore on Steam. And if you want to become a playtester and have the possibility to already play the current version and give feedback on it, consider joining my Patreon. Both links are in the description. The most difficult problem that I faced was layering. You might remember the sorting order that I was talking about earlier. Of course, the game doesn't know automatically where each object in the world is, which means that I have to tell the program this information. And at first sight, this might seem very simple, but sorting a 3D world based on a singular value is actually much harder than I thought. In a world that only consists of blocks, this is fairly easy. I already figured out a simple way to implement it for the flat 2D world before. To calculate the sorting order, you basically only had to calculate the horizontal row the object is in, which is simply just calculated by adding the cell's x and y values. If you do that for each cell on a grid, you can see that it gives you horizontal rows that grow in value the further you go up on the y-axis. But we have to draw objects that are here in front of objects that are here. So we just multiply the sum of both values with minus 1, which just mirrors all values on the x-axis. Now the objects are correctly sorted on a 2D plane. Now when considering the third dimension, we could just add the height value to the calculation, giving us a working function that correctly sorts blocks in a 3D grid. Problem is just that not all objects are blocks. Buildings and vegetation are often multiple blocks high or wide. My first approach for this was just creating the sum of all the objects occupied cells sorting orders and then just taking the average. This actually works for smaller objects, but it breaks as soon as an object has a diameter larger than 2 into any direction. I tried around to find a mathematical solution for this, but failed miserably, since it seems to be pretty much impossible. But after some time I ended up with a solution. By adding a weight in the form of a factor to the y-axis, I could make that axis the dominant component for sorting. 
Inside of a layer, the object gets sorted by the median sorting order of all cells in that layer. But now I still had to take the y-axis into consideration, which is done by slicing each object that is taller than one block into horizontal slices during runtime, and then giving each slice the corresponding base sorting order with the weighted y-layer sorting order added. That way I'm able to sort 3D objects that are larger than two blocks based on only one singular value. Great, so everything runs, right? Unfortunately, sorting hell is not over yet. When coding this, I first just used multiple tile maps and layered them to create 3D terrain. This creates the very simple issue that all blocks in a tile map can only have the same sorting order since they are all part of the same mesh, which gets rendered together. This is no problem when only sorting blocks, since Unity does the sorting inside of a tile map for you. But as soon as you have objects outside the time map, this becomes a problem. For example, these two blocks are on the same layer in the world and by that part of the same time map. This means that they share the same sorting order. But that means that the player, for example, can only get rendered in front or behind, but never between the two blocks since they get drawn at the same time. So I had to write my own custom time map system that allows me to give each block an individual sorting order. Now the layering was finally working and I could move on to something else. The rest of this update was actually just rewriting and redesigning all of the existing mechanics that relied on the old 2D logic. Of course, that means that the new version now includes a lot of untested code and will probably come with a large selection of new bugs for the playtesters to discover. I tried to get everything up and running before this video, but unfortunately I wasn't able to implement all the old mechanics into the new version just yet. So a few smaller things like grid line strength, customization, slimes and ruins are still currently missing, but we'll be following in the next update a couple of days after this video. So after all this time and countless requests, the game finally has elevation. It still has some smaller issues, like the depth perception issue that I will be trying to solve in a later update. At first I was a bit afraid that the elevation would feel weird due to the game's perspective perspective and 2D nature. However, I think that people were right, and that the elevation gives the game a lot of gameplay value and new potential. Of course, it's going to still take a couple of updates until everything feels smoothly and polished. I know that I don't upload very often, but between the videos on my channel there is actually a lot happening behind the scenes and also new versions being released to the playtesters. If you want to stay up to date, vote on new features, or just hang out with the community, join the Isocore Discord server. The link is in the description. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.